Welcome. We're here with Eddie Suzuki. This is Community Matters with Think Tech Hawaii. And Eddie Suzuki is a prolific writer, musician, um, music store owner, manager, agent, uh, rancher, a collector of fine and unique cars and properties and an all-around amazing fascinating individual. So welcome to Community Matters, Thank Eddie you. Suzuki. Thank you. So glad to have you here. So uh, you have such a rich and interesting life. You're mm -hmm. almost 90. I don't even know where to get started, but mm -hmm. I guess we'll start at the beginning. Yeah. So I know that you were um, the second child of 10. Yes. And um, so can you just tell us a little bit about your your background, well, your childhood, I'm, early years? I'm part of a third generation, <clears throat> and um, I come from a family of 10, and uh, I'm number two, and uh, all my family, out, out of my 10, we, three of them passed away, and we still got seven left, you know, in our family, and uh, I just love music. Music was my, my greatest ambition, you know. How did you get started with music? Well, I started as a shoe shine boy in uh, during the war on the Nuwanu and the Pauwahi Street. That was my corner, oh. and uh, I made dimes and nickels, and uh, I paid for my piano lesson with that. And uh, I learned from a renowned piano teacher at that time called Momi Jones, and I learned from her how to play the piano. And I took lessons from her for three months, and that was enough for me, and I could play already, you know? And I started that way in my musical career. And I also played at the, uh, I went to Farrington High School, and I played at the high school band I played clarinet there, learned, learned a little bit about, more about music as a, you know, team, you know, a big ah. group of musicians, and a lot of them are, are gone now, but a lot of them, some of them are still alive, friends of mine, and uh, that's how I, I got started, and uh, did, even at that time, when I was 12 years old, I had a passion to uh, write music. I was composing at 12 wow. songs, you know, my own way, in my own way, and I, nobody taught me. I just did it myself and uh, kept going and, and as became a professional entertainer playing the piano and uh, just traveling all around Hawaii. I played it um, when I became professional. <clears throat> I played at all of the uh, major hotel showroom. Played music, you know, background and whatever. Yeah, and I know you've played and met some of the most famous people of our time, from yes. Frank Sinatra to Mel Torme to yeah. Joan Rivers and all of that. And we're going to get to that uh, probably in the next segment. But I wanted to go back a little bit. You were talking about when you um, were a shoeshine boy at 12, and that's when you started taking your lessons. and. Um, I just wanted to know what uh, what was your first step after you learned piano, then what was your next step for music? And you said you were in the Farrington High Band. I know that was one yeah. thing, too, that influenced you heavily. Then I, at school, at high school, uh, in the, during those days, there was a big band era. And then I started a, a band of my own, which we played at uh, high school dances. No, yes, that's great. Yes. And uh, we had the full 16-piece orchestra, like what they had at that time. And uh, we copied the, uh, you know, like uh, Glenn Miller and okay. Audie Shaw and all of those type of people. We, we bought their uh, song sheets and we played from there. And that's how we got started with group type of playing. But I was always interested in, and I played the piano in the group. Oh, also I was the, the leader group. and I played okay. the piano. And we, we did some jobs at school dances and stuff nice. like that. And didn't you tell me a story about uh, when you were playing in high school, you played at graduation even, yeah. and 
then what, what, what happened? Oh, the graduation was uh, played by the high school band. Mm -hmm. We had a band of about, I think, 40, 50 people. And uh, we played, during the graduation, we had to play the graduation march and dun, all, that dun, 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 yeah, right. all, all of that stuff. And uh, that's why when I was playing there, uh, they were giving out the diploma. But uh, I could never go, go up and get a diploma like everybody else because I was in a band. Oh, and, so you... <laughs> uh, and I, when we left, I left and I didn't get my diploma. To this day? To this day. Well, we're working on that. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're going to work on so getting that. Today, I don't have a diploma for high school. I graduated and uh, I was not too bright in school and uh but in the traditional I, sense anyway yeah, but. i excelled in music shop and uh music shop art and art but everything else i was terrible but my music and stuff gave me a higher grade so i graduated you know i graduated as like a c minus student right yeah well you graduated so yeah. what did you do after high school then then uh, I continued playing music, and I started. I wanted to become a, uh, involved with the piano, so I learned how to become a piano tuner. How did you do that? Yeah, uh, there was a guy in Waikiki, right on uh, Kalakaua, who had a piano shop. I don't know what they call it. His name was Chester Jackson. And he repaired and tuned piano as his trade. He had a store there. So I wanted to learn how to tune pianos and stuff, but there was no way I could learn unless I go to the mainland. And there's schools on the mainland where you can learn, but I couldn't afford to go to the school. So I went to talk to him. One day, I waited out the door, and I saw him working inside of the shop. So I got enough nerve to go in and say, uh, I would like to learn how to become a piano tuner and a piano repairman. Uh, I said, I have to learn it here as an apprentice, and I'm willing to work free to learn it, because if I go to the mainland, I'll have to pay for the plane and, and all of that, and I couldn't right. afford that. So I, he, he, he was so happy to see a guy like me come in, and he said, uh, I can't get you working for me free because we have a law. So he said, but I'm going to pay you 50 cents an hour, but you're going to have to do whatever I tell you. But, and one of the things he told me, I never forgot, he says, I'm going to teach you everything I know in the piano. piano. And then I worked for him for about two years, and I learned the trade. I did all of the repairing and everything like that. And then he got called. He come from a piano tuning family. Then he come from Redlands, California. <clears throat> so his father-in-law, who owned the, the piano store on the mainland, died. So he had to go back and take over the business, take over. The, it was a bigger store and everything. So he told me, Eddie, you're doing well and you can handle it, so I'm giving you my business. So he gave me the business, all the tools and everything, and he wrote every customer that he had, he sent them a letter telling them that I was capable of following wow. through, although I was a young kid, you know. You were I only could. 18. Yeah, and I could, uh, I don't think I even was 18. I must have been 17 or something like that. And. Uh, I opened up uh, a store on Bertana Street, a small little piano repairing shop. And that's where I started up my musical piano business. And I remember you telling me that as the times changed, people didn't have pianos as much anymore. It wasn't as popular. Yeah. And so then you turned your store into just a music store and mostly sold guitars. Yeah. And that's how you met a lot of people because right. they'd come here and play. Yeah, yeah. And All of a sudden, uh, at one time, Everybody wanted to learn the piano. The families send their children to piano you know, school and everything. And so piano was real popular 
regular, uh, you know, regular piano, not electric piano. All right. But then, uh, so that the business started to slow down. But all of a sudden, Elvis Presley came into the picture, and everybody wanted to buy, play guitar. Mm. So the piano business went kind of down. Guitar just came crazy. So my shop, which at that time was at Kapiolani and P. Koi, I had a good-sized piano store. I converted into half guitar business. Mm. You know, so I started to sell guitars and did very well in piano and very well in guitar. And weren't you the exclusive distributor for Ibanez? Ibanez, yeah. Ibanez was a guitar that, you see, because I was new at the business, I could not get the good franchises like Gibson and Martin and all of that stuff. Fender. Oh, so okay. All I could get was an unknown guitar called Ibanez. So I became the distributor of Ibanez and that guitar was made in Japan, unheard of. But uh, I started to sell Ibanez and I promoted the guitar and before you know it, Ibanez in Hawaii became the number one guitar. Uh, we outsold anybody. How about that? I, I, had, wow. I had inventory of about 250 guitars. Incredible. Nobody. Fender or anybody had that kind of inventory. Oh yeah, tell us a quick story about your Ibanez, some of your ideas, uh, and, and you had the party, oh, the yeah. Ibanez party. <laughs> yeah, uh, and George Benson, who he and I became very, very close and very good friends, uh, became a promoter for Ibanez. They, he used to play the Gibson guitar, and he was a jazz musician just starting out at that time, and uh, he wanted Gibson to make a guitar for him under his label, uh, his, his uh, patent and stuff like that. But they didn't want to do it because he was kind of unknown, and they already had big names. So they didn't want to do it, so he searched around and he found out about Ibanez. He liked the guitar, it was a very good guitar, and they were willing to make models with his name. So he took the, uh, the what do you call it, that ability and the uh, time to do that. And he made a couple Ibanez guitars, jazz guitars, and a semi-rock and roll guitar. And all of a sudden, he was a guitar player, but then he started to sing. And when he started to sing, all of a sudden, he became a national hit. You know, and but because he re, he played the Gibson, I mean the Ibanez guitar, and because I was a distributor of Ibanez in Hawaii, he and I became very very personal good friends. And didn't you guys throw a party or something? Yeah, yeah. and uh, to promote it, I one of the things I used was the switches on. In other words, everybody's going to trade in their Gibsons and Fenders and everything to buy Ibanez and. That was the name of your, your uh, uh, promotion? Or, yeah, okay, the I had an <laughs> ad in the paper every week. And every time a, a professional bought an Ibanez, I put his picture in the newspaper. Okay. Saying the switch is on, and this guy is now playing Ibanez. I took his Gibson in or Fender in as a trade. Nice. Sold him an Ibanez. And then they had exclusive rights to go to a party if they yeah, had an Ibanez, then, but some guys showed up. But we're I, about to go to commercial. So I just wanted to, uh, we're going to finish that story when we get back and more interesting stories with Eddie okay. Suzuki in a moment. Thanks so much. Aloha, my name is Justina Spiritu and I'm the co-host of Hawaii Series. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson, and you can catch us every Thursday at 4 p.m. at thinktechhawaii.com. What do we talk about, Matt? So on Hawaii Farmers Series, we're going to be bringing on the farmers and also supporter of farmers including restaurants, caterers, as well as government supporters and nonprofits to hear their background stories and understanding our local ag community just a little bit better. Yeah, essentially there's a lot more that goes into farming and the local food community beyond just producing the food. And we want to feature and get the background story on all these folks and see how we all work together as a community. So join us every Thursday. 
Aloha. Hi, my name is Hilary Weinberg. I'm the host of The Whole Gamut on Think Tech Hawaii. See us live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. or on our YouTube channel to hear us talk about world affairs from Hawaii and beyond. See you then. Aloha, I'm Carlos Juarez, host of Global Connections, and I want to invite you to come join us. We, we cover a range of global issues. We bring a lot of expert opinion, uh, a lot of issues, whether they're contemporary events happening in the world or maybe looking at things from a more historical perspective. Uh, global issues, very important for us to understand in this globally interconnected world. Join us here on Global Connections. Any Thank you so much for being with us again, Eddie Suzuki. So we left off you telling us about Ibn S before we get on to many other yeah. fascinating parts well, of your life. But so the Ibn S party, we, we were taking Gibsons and Ibn S and Martin, not Ibn S, Gibson, Fenders and Martin in on trade, and I threw a party. I rented the uh, penthouse for Alamona Hotel, three of them. And we threw our call at George Benson, Ibanez's party. And uh, in order to come to the party, you had to buy an Ibanez guitar. So everybody was switching their guitars to buy Ibanez to come to the party to meet George Benson and play with him. And at the party, he would play along with the, the top local musicians here. And he, uh, George Benson was a big name then. So uh, we threw. <laughs> those parties and a lot of people came to the party because they were friends of mine. I, I was a musician and I knew most of the entertainers. So they, they all says, yeah, but I bought a guitar from you way back. But yeah, but you bought a Gibson. You didn't buy an Ibanez. So this is an Ibanez party. So when you buy an Ibanez, you can come to the party every <laughs> year. <laughs> so they all switched and every week I put a new picture of who who changed from Gibson to the switch? But at the on. party, didn't you have Ibanez? You had like a, a nicer one, and you had one more reasonable. So yeah. if they wanted to come to the party, they could buy one right the there on the one. stop. They can buy on the spot, and they can get a pass to come in. <laughs> and we we had about uh, usually about we rented three for the penthouse right on the top, and we it, probably about seventy five people wow. was at the party. That's and awesome. playing the music continuously going on. George is playing with all of these guys, and then they, they go out and they say, "Oh, we played with George Benson, right, you know, at the right. party." So everybody look forward to the Ibanez party every right. year. And that's that's great. That's uh, really interesting. It's such a um, novel way to yeah. go about getting customers, and yeah. and the fact that you got into the business, you know, uh, when you were still a teenager, and then worked your way up to now you know having you know your own musical career as well as the store right. and all these parties and stuff but i wanted to go back uh, before we move on to so many other fascinating parts of your life but um back when you were growing up and you were 12 uh you know uh shining shoes paying for your way to yeah. uh you know to your piano lessons with Momi jones you also were a normal 12 year old in in many respects well, and we you used had to friends go fishing and, uh -huh. every sunday at tier 32. we lived up in cam heights and we had to walk about five miles wow. to wake up real early and sunrise we were at the place uh, fish like to uh, you know bite bite early in the morning sunrise so we had to be at the pier by sunrise. You and your friends? Me and a few friends that okay. we had that who liked fishing. And we caught a lot of fish from the pier. And uh, we were kids, you know, catching 12 years old, 13 years old, catching. And then uh, during that time, uh, there were a lot of maneuvers. American planes maneuvering. Because it's war To time. me, they were getting ready for war. Oh, okay. uh, all these American fighter planes and bombers and everything were maneuvering. So it was December 7, we were there fishing, and all of a sudden we, we thought this maneuver starting pretty early, sunrise, and we saw these planes coming in from Nuano, from Nuano, and they were the Japanese planes. And they were all coming in very low, just above our head, and coming down towards the Aloha Tower turning around and going straight to Pearl Harbor, low as they can, you know? 
and uh, and we saw I saw myself these, these were torpedo bombers I, I knew a little bit about airplanes and stuff like that as a kid I used to make models and stuff and these were torpedo bombers with big torpedoes under them I never saw that before right and they were all going towards Pearl Harbor and the funny part about it is uh, they had these planes beautiful planes and uh, I never thought Japan had planes like that you know beautiful planes and it was three seaters American uh, torpedo bombers or whatever they had they had two seats okay they had a pilot and a gunner in the back but these there were three seats I remember that and I waved at the at these uh, pilots and they look like the first world war pilot with the leather hamlet and everything right. but I never saw that before they were waving. I didn't know they were Japanese uh, pilots you know and they waved back Wow. And, because we were kids you know right. and they were on their way to drop the torpedoes at the Pearl Harbor and then you heard I heard big booms and this and this then all of a sudden <clears throat> the guard came rushing to us and told the kid all of us get out of here go home they didn't tell us it was a war right just go home so we went home and about 11 o'clock we found out it was a war we, until then, we thought it was maneuvered. Wow. You know? That's wild. Yeah. We were just kids. But I, I never forgot that. I remember. That's, That's December 7, you know? Yeah, you don't forget <coughs> that. That's for sure. Yeah. So, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your musical career. I know we're hopping around a lot, but you have to do that with your story because it's just so rich and multi-layered you have so many things going on but i know music was the biggest part of your life right and so i just and i know you've played and met some of the you know most famous people and i know you were on a tv show with frank sinatra was yeah. what, what yeah, tell, the, tell the, us about the that the magnum show here the last magnum show here frank sinatra was on it they tried to uh they were losing the uh i think cbs was losing their uh, contract, uh, Mag Magnum. Ratings so were they, going. So they wanted down. to bring their rating up. Uh, so the last two shows, from what I heard, they wanted to bring Super Saz in. So they brought Frank Sinatra in and made, mm -hmm. made a part for him and everything. And he came in and we were riding motorcycles then. I was, you know, riding motorcycles at that time. And, uh, but at that time I was already in my musical career I was going to Las Vegas and all around traveling around doing shows for United Airlines and stuff like that so um, wherever United Airlines uh, had their hub they sent us to do a show there to bring right. tours to Hawaii I think they were the biggest carrier then you know and um, uh, we I played at most of the major hotels, uh, doing shows, you know, all these different places. And at that time, I was doing shows for Hawaiian Airlines, doing, uh, you know, tr uh, parties and, and uh, advertising Hawaiian Airlines with my group. I had a small show group. And then uh, at that time, already, I was kind of associating with Kuili. In fact, first I associated with Ernie Washington, a jazz pianist, and he, I met, started to manage him, and he was very successful. In a small time we're here, but he was a famous uh, piano player from New York. And he, he was a, a piano player with uh, Charlie Parker, who's the greatest jazz musician there is. And he came to Hawaii for his personal reason. He wanted to get away from New York. And he and I met, and before you know it, we became good friends. And I, he wanted me to manage him. So I managed his career in the beginning, and very successful. We played at all the jazz clubs in Honolulu. Then, uh, then I ran into Kui Lee, and Kui wanted me to be his manager. And since I was writing songs, and he was writing songs, I took on the job of being Kui's manager. 
And uh, after two weeks, I got him to open up at Queen Surf. Wow. You know, and we had a big show that at that time, Don Ho had a big show. And Kui Lee was like a, Don Ho started. Like opener for him? Well, Don Ho got famous doing Kui Lee's song. Oh. Like I, I remember you and one paddle and like Kui like got that. famous doing your song, Miley Lay, which I failed to mention at the introduction that you got a legacy award for Miley Lay, the song, and, and now all of the fifth graders in Hawaii yeah. have to learn that song. And yeah, it became a Hawaiian standard. Yeah. So, uh, but that was after with Kui, not, not uh, before. I wrote the song 50 years ago, but uh, it really became popular maybe about 20, 30 years ago, you know, and the, the Department of Education used the, used the song to teach the kids uh, about the Miley Lay, and uh, that right. helped me a because lot. Because before that, it was just Norman Kay's song, A Miley Lay for Your Hair, Right. but you decided it, it, that... We needed would... something better than that. Not better than that, but more classic, because what Miley Lay... What I learned about what Miley Lay meant to us was uh, greater than just an ordinary lay. It was a special lay of royalty and everything. So there's got to be some good music for that. The presentation, what it is, and why we, we love the lay so much, and uh, for the presentation of the lay. So I wrote that song, Miley Lay, where this lay, Miley Lay, the presentation, and I, in the beginning, I wrote the uh, verse telling what it meant to us. And the Department of Education wanted to teach the kids that about right. Miley Lay. So they put it in their curriculum to teach the fifth graders the song and made it a Hawaiian standard. And that's the thing gave me a big start in getting it rolling. And I did it. And Sam Kapu was the first guy who recorded it. And then after a while, Ben Vegas, who used to play in my group, who, you know, who I worked with and showed him the show, this business and everything. Now he's real popular. And uh, he did his version of Miley Lay, which was a little different than what we did. And it became a hit, you know? And wow. And now you got a Lifetime, a lifetime Achievement Award for right, it. Right, for you know? the song Miley Lay. Huh? Yeah, so let's... And then now I'm still writing, and then I'm writing a lot more songs. And That's I right. Just, you have two albums out already. Uh, yeah. uh, what was your first album, New Beginnings, was High it? High Tide. High Tide, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. That I had uh, 12 songs in that original. But uh, then my second album, I just did it last year. Like the collectors, like the greatest yeah. hits kind of thing? Yeah. And now you're working on another album. Right. Yeah. At almost 90, you don't yeah. stop. <laughs> and yeah. you're also still very active. Uh, in the meantime, is writing and, and composing and, and singing and playing. You're also taking care of your um, luxury um, real estate, the, all your uh, one-of-a-kind real estate that you yeah. have on Oahu. I know you have uh, one of the only... Um, people that owns land on Parker Ranch and one of the largest plots and one of and the largest paint horse ranch with uh, I got 12 horses there, 12 paint horses, you know. Wow. And I still have it and I go there about once a month, but uh, I haven't gone for a while, but I have to go there every month. I have 12 beautiful paint horses. Yes, you do. Yeah. And you have an amazing, You, I think you have Hugh Hefner's motorcycle there on that ranch. Yeah. And, well, there's so many more stories, but right now we're going to take a break and then we'll come back and talk okay. about some more of them. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. This is Reg Baker and I am the host of Business in Hawaii. We talk about positive stories, positive stories of businesses in Hawaii, how they have been successful and how they have overcome some of the obstacles that a lot of us encounter when we try to have a business here. And believe it or not, there are a number of positive stories here and we want to talk to all of you. So we broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock, uh, and it rebroadcasts again on Olelo Channel 54. So I sure hope to see you next time. Please tune in on Thursdays at 2 o'clock.
Thank you. Hello, ha, huh. how you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, asking you to come join us on Think Tech Hawaii Hibachi Talk. Join me and my two hosts, Gordo the Texar and Andrew the Security Guy, every Friday from 12.45 till 13.45. See you on Fridays, and remember, let your wing gang free, wherever you be. <laughs> Welcome back. To Community Connection. We're talking to the famous Eddie Suzuki. So honored to be in your presence and to talk to you today and, and talk about your very fascinating and rich life. I know when we uh, started our break, you were talking about your ranch, which I know is another big source mm -hmm. of pride for you, your um, horse ranch. A lot of people have cattle ranches, but very few have horse ranches, right. uh, paint horse ranches on um, the, island, the big yeah. island on Parker Ranch, and uh, and it's a beautiful property. I yeah. know. Well, I uh, bought paint horses, and I had uh, advice from my good friend, who I met, uh, Cliff Boniz, and he had a couple paint horses, and I told him I was really interested in those colored horses, paint horses. So he told me, we don't have good ones here in Hawaii. So the only way we can bring in some good paint horses is we got to go to the mainland. And paint horses was something new. At one time, they used to call the paint horses uh, uh, pintos. Oh, but yeah. pintos were wild mustangs in the mountain with colors, and the Indian chiefs loved them. You know, the chief always had a colored horse. Oh, and the, okay. the regular. Uh, Braves had just the regular horses, right? So, and they, they, they especially they had to go and catch those uh, pintos and stuff. But then some people got together, um, and they wanted to make that an uh, official title. At that time, there was no paint horses, so they started an organization called the Paint Horse Organization. And what they did was took registered quarter horses and. They got some thoroughbreds, but mostly quarter horse, and uh, made their own paint horses and registered them. So the paint horse line, most of them are registered horses. Oh. Pintos are mostly just Mustangs. Okay, and what, isn't there a story about your uh, the the start of your rent, the the war line? Of oh horses? yeah. Well, I wanted the the best horses I could get. So I went to the mainland with my friend Cliff Money, and we studied the uh, paint horse magazine and called up all the different ranches that had famous paint horses, visited them on the mainland, and I ended up buying 10 paint horses and brought it back to Hawaii and, you know, set it up on my ranch. I had a 10-acre ranch at that time in Waikiki. On, but, on Parker Ranch. How big yeah. is it now? Uh, now it's about 50 some odd acres. Wow. I, I bought the other, a bigger ranch because I ended up with 10 paint horses. And first I thought one paint horse per acre. So I had 10 <laughs> acres. But when I brought the horses back, my God, they ate all the grass in, in no time. So I knew I had to get a bigger ranch. Wow. So now. Well, aren't they uh, part War Glory, which is your first? Uh, thoroughbred, right? Didn't he? Isn't he from the no, same no. line of horses? Well, the first horse I had was called uh, Vega Jack. Oh yeah, Vega Jack. Vega that's Jack. Right. But War Glory is the. Uh, I bought uh, Vega Jack died, so I needed another stallion. All branches have to have a good stallion to propagate the the line. So I had like, uh, I bought one stallion, nine mares to start the thing going here in Hawaii. And uh, when I brought them back, and then when I bought the, uh, uh, what do you call that, Vega Jack, he was kind of old already. And uh, the only reason I could, I bought him was because he had a beautiful offspring. And uh, I wanted to buy the offspring. This was in, uh, in uh, Oregon. I wanted to buy the offspring, but the owner of that brand says, I won't sell the offspring unless you take the, the, the stallion with it. So he sold me the stallion real cheap. So I bought the stallion and he, 
the, the mare, you know, the, the young mare, and uh, brought it back with nine other horses, or oh, eight other horses, and brought ten back to away. And that's the same line that, of, of horses that used, were in Seabiscuit, yeah? The yeah. And, uh, but, you know, they, they propagated, and so far at my ranch, I've had about seven babies. Wow. Uh, from the, from the, and then, oh, by then, then I got the uh, war glory because uh, after having Vega Jack for about four years, he passed away. And uh, the horses lived to about 25, 30 years. Okay. So the, he passed away, so I had to go and get another stallion. So I went up to the uh, check again and bought uh, war glory from uh, Montana. Okay. And I brought him back. And that now he's my stallion. And he's a descendant of the, the same horses yeah. that were on Sea Biscuit yeah. and all of that. Yeah. Okay. He, he's part of the descendant of the uh, the paint, I mean, the war horses. Ah, okay. So that's why his name is War Glory. Oh, nice. But he's a paint horse. Most of the war horses were just black. Okay. And the, the, the most famous one was the grandfather who was the uh, man of war. Oh, then okay. they had the war animal, which is a triple crown champion and the movie uh, uh, Sea Biscuit was based on that and Sea Biscuit raced with War Glory in the movie not War Glory uh, War Admiral uh -huh. and beat War Admiral and come to find out Sea Biscuit was a war horse too a descendant oh wow, yeah. wow. so the you know the, the war horse they had two triple crown nice yeah so uh, another thing on Big Island that you did besides uh, be a rancher, you were a huge part. I think probably some sort of somewhere in the leadership of the uh, bike club. Oh yeah, I was a member of the. Uh, I was the only one from Honolulu who was a member of the club called uh, uh, Line Riders. But everyone came from everywhere. After a while, you guys no, made it so big. No, Line Riders was a group from the Big Island, and uh, but they they were throwing big parties. I mean, not probably, but they call it Rodeos. Oh, uh, Rodeo. Yeah, they were, they were not just motorcycle riders. They were all businessmen. So they knew how to throw big parties. And we used to, at our parties, we had about 2,000 motorcycles come from all the islands and from the mainland to ride in this big Rodeo that we used to have. And uh, I was uh, there, and since I was involved in music, they made me chairman of the music. Ah, okay. thing and I brought the, the shows there and we had shows you know a big show and everything like that wonderful time yeah and you rode with Andy Bumatai I yeah. know and yeah and Andy Bumatai rode with me for a couple of years and we very good friends you know great well I, I know that we only have a few minutes left so I want to get to there's just so many things I haven't even begun to scratch the surface in your very interesting life and um, but I just wanted to know if you uh, could give some advice to musicians. Yeah. Um, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, so musicians or, or young people, uh, what would you like to say? Well, I sure would like to see a lot more songwriters and uh, do what they feel like. In other words, writing to me, the people from Hawaii, born in Hawaii, should be able to make the best uh, Hawaiian type of modern Hawaiian music. In other words, if we do any other type of music, we're in the wrong direction. We're from Hawaii, we're born in Hawaii, we got the feeling of Hawaii, the music should be Hawaii. Right. You know, because if we're like, I feel that when I write music here, I'm top of the line. But if I were to write music about New York, then I'd be the last of the line. Right. So why not do what, what's best, and that's what I've been doing. So all of my music is, uh, is uh, based on my true life in Hawaii and my love for Hawaii. Yeah, and I'm capable of putting it, make it happen the words, the music, telling stories about my life. Right, you know. it's just storytelling that yeah. you just do so beautifully. And I know you played with Carlos Santana when he was here. Yeah. Um, and I played with a lot of big musicians 
I, when I traveled on the road. And you, know? you still, I, I like that you, you know, you do play uh, songs that are popular, but you yeah. always give them a Hawaiian twist and, and yeah. your own twist. And, yeah. and Never copy anybody. Just do your own feeling, you know, whatever. We, we used to call people that copy music in my era, we, if you copy, and no matter how good you copy, the better, better you copy is what we call bubble gum. Uh. In other words, you, you copy. But to me, music is you've got to create your own whatever. Learn, but after you learn, do your own. I would make that advice to people. Just do their own and stick with Hawaii. Write about Hawaii, how they feel about Hawaii. Right. So um, your new album is going to ha have a lot of uh, some traditionals, some some songs that people know, but also some new songs. Oh, and yeah. My new album has about 10 new songs that I've written. We have about 14 songs on the album, but, uh, you know. It's so when can we look for that? Well, it'll be coming out very shortly. I'm just promoting it now. So and if people... It's not on the market. Uh, it's more like a promotion. Okay. No. But if people want to learn more about you or, or get a CD or something like that, can they contact you at Eddie Suzuki at gmail.com? Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, I'm so excited to find out when that's going on. And I know that you're uh, in the paper sometimes when you have new things coming out, they always put you in the entertainment section of what's new and happening. Yeah. And um, so I think that Hawaii is ready for another Eddie Suzuki well, album. And yeah, I'm working on one. A couple of my songs on the album is, you know, I wrote that song, uh, Happy Valentine. All right. I know that's, that's necessary because we don't really have a good Valentine song. And another song was Congratulation. Oh, gosh. We're having so many congratulations, exactly. but there's no music for it. That's perfect. So I wrote that. Well, I'm so glad. We're wrapping up now. Is there any final word that you'd like to, what, what would you like, legacy would you like to leave behind? What? Well, I'd like to leave my legacy of music behind Beautiful. me. And uh, so for my family and everything like that, yeah. Well. So, and it's happening. Seems yes, like. it is. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. It's been such a joy. You're so interesting. And thank you so much for joining us.